Hello, everybody. Welcome to Siren Coffee and Science. I'm Dr. Sarah DeSilvi. I'm a family nurse practitioner in a rural health center in Vermont. I'm also the social determinants of health clinical informatics director of the Gravity Project and a member of the pediatric faculty at the UVM Larner College of Medicine. Today's conversation continues to explore the topic of awareness. As, an, as a reminder, this includes the many ways healthcare systems are incorporating activities to understand patient social, social circumstances. One of which is asking patients at the point of care about things like financial security. I am thrilled and honored to have the opportunity to talk today with Michael Baylett, founder of Baylett Health, a consulting firm dedicated to ensuring to ensure and provider performance accountability. In our conversation, we will unpack how state Medicaid agencies are building awareness initiatives into state level strategies, as well as the barriers and facilitators of state level approaches. Before we launch this conversation, I will share a few logistics. We welcome you to submit questions via the Q&A feature. We've also activated the upvote and comment features of the Q&A and invite you to interact with other participants' questions during the session. In past sessions, there have been some great discussions occurring between audience members. We can keep it going. And as a reminder, today's conversation is being recorded and will be released as a podcast in about a week. So hello, Michael, welcome. It really is an honor. Um, so we, we were talking earlier, um, we were starting the, um, talking about the podcast, starting with a, like a basic question, given your vast expertise in this realm, just to orient us to the history of social risk screening and state approaches, just to bring us up to speed. Sure. So um, it's been well known for a long time that social determinants of health have an influence on population health, but for states, that's mostly been the domain of public health. Mm -hmm. And state Medicaid agencies really um, have not been engaged in the concept of identifying and potentially trying to mitigate mm -hmm. um, social risk factors at the individual level or social determinants of health at the upstream level. Um, and so the, the connection of Medicaid to this topic is a pretty recent phenomenon. In fact, mm -hmm. I would say five years ago, I never heard of any states talking about it. Yeah. Uh, and it really just blew up um, overnight, uh, not in all states, but uh, in a significant number of states. And, uh, and the first thing that uh, states began to do was to ask their health plans or sometimes their contracted providers to begin to screen for individual social risk factors. And so um, you have a couple uh, lovely briefs on this topic, I should say. <laughs> So one of the things um, that we were talking about also is, is the role that measurement and quality measures play in, um, in social risk screening. And there are some design topics that you talk about in two of your briefs, like elements of design when approaching quality measurement. I'm wondering if we could explore some of them today. Sure. So, you know, when Medicaid agencies decided that they wanted to hold their, uh, their managed care organizations or their accountable care organizations accountable, um, what does it mean to hold someone accountable? Well, it means assessing whether or not they did what they were supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, step one is put in a requirement that you screen patients, members. And step two is, then for states, was to figure out, so um, are they doing it? Mm -hmm. And uh, and so this was a challenge for states because um, there are right now no measures of social risk factor screening that reside in any national measure set. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work, as you know personally, to, um, being done to develop such measures. But right now, um, there are no such measures. And so the, the early actors among state Medicaid agencies uh, stepped out and began developing their own measures. Mm -hmm. And Massachusetts and Rhode Island um, were first, uh, then North Carolina and, uh, and Oregon most recently. Uh, and so um, the development of the measure got wrapped up into the uh, design of the requirement to screen mm -hmm. uh, because the, the measure par parameters had to match the requirement that was being put on top of managed care plans or ACOs. And so, so some of the questions were, well, so who needs to be screened? Mm -hmm. um, is it 
is it everyone in the population of a health plan or attributed to an ACO, or is it just those people who've come in for care? And is it just those people who've come in for primary care? Or what about people who've been connected with a care manager, a care coordinator? Mm -hmm. so, so that's an early design decision. Which people? Mm -hmm. um, how are they screened? Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't matter how they screened. Um, for what are they screened? Mm -hmm. And uh, is the state going to specify um, a specific screening tool? If not, is it going to specify domains? Is it going to give a menu of domains? Um, and uh, uh, and so the, the questions just sort of uh, uh, roll out. And for all of the states that were defining um, social risk factor screening and then developing a measure, they had to answer those questions mm -hmm. because those gave structure to their measure. And in fact, states have made different decisions. Yeah, so we were actually, uh, one of the things I was thinking about when I was reading the brief um, and just kind of parsing through some of the design decisions you've already talked about, is like the equity considerations when you ask a question like who should be screened, right? So if you choose that you're screening and those individuals who are able to make it to a primary care office by design, you're excluding anybody who has limitations in access. So any thoughts on, on those kinds of cons like deeper considerations when you go through the design elements? Yeah, so there's a there are trade-offs, right? We always mm -hmm. have trade-offs. So um, the more inclusive that the state wants to be, the more technically complex and challenging it is to gather the data to generate the measure. Um, so that that's real issue. I mean, Oregon just developed a recommendation that said data should be accepted from all sources. Mm -hmm. Okay, so social <laughs> service organization, primary care, behavioral health, the health mm -hmm. plan, you know, that's great in terms of inclusiveness, but it's also much harder to pull off from a measurement perspective than if you did something simple like saying um, only people who've had a primary care visit. Yeah, it, um, so there's a question here. Um, what about the step that follows providing the service and treatment access identified by the screen? Um, Michael, I don't know if you want to speak to that or whether um, I can I can try to address it a little bit from a perspective Go ahead. of how do you work. Um, so first of all, I just want to ground us right now um, in first of all, the importance of addressing that question. Uh, it's critically important. As, uh, Michael and I were mentioning earlier that um, we are working nationally on developing core quality measures that kind of mirror behavioral health measure approaches. So there's the screen and intervene approach that we know very well from like the HEDIS depression screening and intervention measure. So it's very much what we're thinking going forward. I do want to say um, very carefully that right now in this phase of the coffee and science, we're trying to focus on the awareness, which is really focused on the screening, um, but there certainly are implications of intervention. But I do want to reassure you that we are kind of considering those uh, measure approaches as we go forward. Anything else to say? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would say in, in all the discussions that we've had with states on measure development and helping them with measure development, um, everyone's talking about what's the measure development trajectory because everyone recognizes that the screen alone isn't sufficient. Uh, and so it's possible to envision what are the successor measures. Um, I will note the successor measures are also more challenging because they, um, they ultimately have to speak to um, uh, connection with organizations outside of the organization that's doing the screening uh, mm -hmm. and information looping back. Absolutely. One of the things that we um, talk about in our work in the Gravity Project is identifying needs in clinical settings, but solving them in communities and the complexity of that truth and figuring out how to speak the same language. Um, so we, again, kind of sticking with um, the role of quality measures. So uh, just discussing kind of some of the trends regarding what social domains are currently included consistently across some of the approaches we know about, such as Rhode Island or Massachusetts or North Carolina, because one of the design elements you consider very carefully in both of your briefs is what to screen for. So just thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, states have taken different approaches. I would say Food and housing insecurity, um, always, always. Um, uh, transportation frequently, but then there's, you know, there's some variation in terms of what people do, um, and and there are some social risk factors that don't get a lot of attention in screening, mm -hmm. but I think might someday. Um, I mean, for example, social isolation, lots and lots of evidence on the health impact of social isolation as a social risk factor. 
not so much screen today um, and, and not a lot of, of mitigation strategies identified either. Um, so I, I, I think um, states really ran uh, into their Medicaid programs into doing screening and addressing social risk factors before the measurement science was really all the way developed uh, and the, the mitigation strategies and yeah. infrastructure were developed either. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of learning by doing going on right now. I think that's a really good thing to say. And I, I think very much of a timely um, consideration is the question we see in the chat box here. So are any states measuring or considering screening for broadband access or any measure of the digital divide given the importance of telehealth going forward? If there ever was a use case, it's the past year. Any thoughts on on what you see that in that ecosystem? I, I've not seen that, um, but I I think this is all so dynamic right now. I I think we will be at a point several years from now where there's some more standardization mm -hmm. uh, among screenings and screening tools. I mean, there will always have to be some um, state and regional variation mm -hmm. uh, because broadband access is obviously an an issue in some geographies and it's not in others. Uh, mm -hmm. And hopefully if we develop a national infrastructure, it won't be an issue for anyone anywhere in time. Um, but I, I, it's it's a little bit the wild west right now in terms of how this is being done. Um, and that won't always be the case. Uh, and in fact, the, the aggressive um, implementation and attention is going to speed up knowledge acquisition um, and our move towards standards in a way that wouldn't happen if you just had a few people at the margins playing around. With it. Um, so there's a few different questions regarding other topics that might be uh, screened for, um, such as Nancy Conley's talking about thriving or flourishing as a metric. Um, that's, actually, that's a really interesting concept. Uh, I think one of the things we'd have to figure out is how to standardize that. We do do reports, very kind of nominal reports of like, I like uh, considerations of how one feels and health reports. Um, do you know of anything regarding thriving or flourishing as a metric in the ecosystem? I have not seen that myself. I haven't, I haven't, but this sort of triggers for me, I just wanna call out a recognition that social risk screening for kids and for adults mm -hmm. um, should not be the same. Mm -hmm. uh, it all, our conversations nationally tend to focus on adults all the time, but mm -hmm. I just wanna note that if you're doing a screen that's specific to social risk factors for kids, it shouldn't mm -hmm. be exactly the same as for adults. Yeah, we see this very um, elegantly in like the approach of like the Bright Futures approach for the, the American Academy of, um, of Pediatricians. Like their like pediatric specific social risk screening is definitely appropriate for developmental stage and age. And that's a whole, I, I just wanna honor that that's a whole other consideration. It makes me think of the design element you have regarding the difference between screening individuals and screening households as well. So that was one of the considerations you had in your brief was um, if a state Medicaid agency is gonna be screening, are you doing household level screening? Or are you doing individual personal level screening? And then, of course, from a pediatric perspective, at what age do you start screening independently? Uh, we, we do in the pediatric and family medicine world consider 12 years old or 11 years old as kind of the starting of screening a person individually. But there aren't that many, very, measure, very many measures that are, um, that are focused on that. Luckily, there is a youth food and security measure that we have from the USDA. Yeah. You know, Sarah, one thing I, I want to mention right now is I think we need to recognize that with the screening requirements and the full range of risk factors that could be screened for, that there is a dimension of, um, of provider burden that we are introducing yes. <laughs> by doing the screening. Yeah. Right. I mean, there are a lot of, there are a lot of practices that are groaning on like, you're going to give me another screen that I have to do on top of the, you know, all the others. Um, and, and the more domains we're screening for, the more burdensome we're making this. And, you know, that's a, a, a tension here. Yeah, and I think that that tension kind of, again, we think about, you know, timing of screening, right? So, you know, that's again, one of the considerations you have, like how often are you screening populations, right? And then it also goes back to the where the data is coming from, because if a community is collectively participating in screening, and so, you know, what could happen in the WIC office is being shared with what's happening in the pediatrician's office or the family practitioner's office, that is like a, you know, accountable communities for health idea, like we're all working together to, to share, like to care for the population. But again, as you were mentioning, it creates, 
data and data sharing and information sharing complexities and measurement complexities, right? So it's like- And patient burden too. Like yeah. you're screening me too? How many times do I have to be screened? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so there's it, it, every single choice we make, right? So if we consider sharing data across different settings, right? It creates complexity and measurement, but it could possibly reduce both provider and patient burden, right? Right. Um, Greg has a really uh, lovely concept here. Uh, Greg, our friend from Open Referral. So um, what weight should clients own assessment of their goals and desired courses of action carry in determining who gets a referral under what circumstances? Is there cause for concern that clients access to care might become dependent on their consent to participate in programs that, that might, they might not actually feel are appropriate for them? Um, can you see that question in the Q&A? Uh so I didn't see it, but I heard you say it. Okay, um, yeah, that's, I just wanna make sure it's a complex one, right? So it's, it's actually, it makes me um, reflect, of course, on the Gottlieb and Alderwork lexi like the lexicon of mm -hmm. um, social needs, right? So you have your social determinants, your social risks and your social needs as identified by the individuals themselves. And then what Greg is asking is like, what, like, if consent and willingness to proceed is part of connection to services, like are there like ethical considerations in that, which I think there probably are. And yeah, I mean, for me, that? that's that's the social risk, social needs distinction, right? Yeah. The screen identifies a risk, but really the patient identifies whether there's a need. Um, that's how that's how this becomes patient centered. Yeah, and I think um, I think the interesting thing is if the connection from clinical settings to community settings it de is dependent on the patient patient's willingness to have that information travel, it can create inequities of a whole other sort, right? And this actually echoes some of the conversations we were having in a previous podcast, right, regarding, you know, histories of um, mistreatment regarding, you know, uh, ethnic and racial minorities and how we cannot forget to, <laughs> to, to, to consider that in people's willingness to participate in this endeavor that we might be doing for reasons that are important to us, but we haven't made the case yet or made created a sense of safety enough to right. proceed. Right, for sure. Uh, so um, Maggie's saying uh, we have, what are the potential unintended and perhaps undesirable consequences of widespread and systemic screening? Uh, could imagine the same data being used for risk adjustment, lowering standards for FQHCs and other providers treating large needy populations. This is important because I think it, you take the two different kinds of risk adjustment in mind. Uh, Dr. Gottlieb and I wrote about that a little bit for health affairs. So there's risk adjustment insofar as the adjustment of quality measure expectations, right? And there's risk adjustment as in shifting money within value-based healthcare toward the, towards individuals with greater social risk. So any thoughts there, Michael? Uh, so I think we flat out do not know enough to be doing social risk adjustment right now. Um, I, I don't even think that we know what the relationship between social risk and some variables are. For example, when it comes to spending, we've looked at data from two different states. One that finds that, that there's lower risk, lower spending associated with uh, social risk, and another that said it's higher spending associated with social risk. Um, and then, of course, it depends what social risk variables you're talking about. So I, I know there's a big appetite for doing social risk adjustment for quality measures and per, yeah. perhaps also for, mm -hmm. for financial purposes. But I just feel like we don't know enough right now. And, you know, as we, um, or maybe I alluded to earlier, we don't have any standardization of even how we're doing measurement. Mm -hmm. So how can you do any adjustment when you're not consistently measuring? So I'm wondering just again, to stay kind of like focused on the topic of the day, right? Given that we've talked, that because there's been so many podcasts covering kind of like aspects of screenings, particularly, if we can kind of shift in our last minutes to talk about some of the quality measure initiatives that states and state Medicaid agencies are doing around the country at this time. Okay, so um, most of the measurement is on whether or not a screen was performed. Um, mm -hmm. There, uh, Massachusetts also actually gathers the results of the screen, so they have a profile of what are the social what's social risk prevalence in the population. Um, I think um, I think the idea of extending beyond just that, to, you know, down the value chain, so to speak, um, is a concept but not yet practiced. Um, there are 
there are some interesting variations that I talked about, or I'm sorry, that uh, one of which I talked about, which was Oregon saying, we're gonna take data from any source. Mm -hmm. um, Rhode Island is doing something interesting in that they are gathering data electronically mm -hmm. from EHRs. Now yeah. their measure is about doing screening in a primary care setting, mm -hmm. but, but they, are, they are working out interfaces um, mm -hmm. They're requiring their Medicaid ACOs to have structured fields in their EHRs for capturing mm -hmm. the screen uh, mm -hmm. so that they can uh, electronically extract the information for measurement purposes, which mm -hmm. I think is a neat step forward. That is a very fascinating step forward. Absolutely. Um, so can we talk a little bit regarding um, so non-clinical, like non-point of care, clinical level um, and more care management approaches to quality measures regarding addressing social risk. So we see some models that are utilizing um, non-office visit-based visit care management approaches, correct? Well, I mean, that's sort of the, the Oregon take it from all sources. So if yeah. you have a care manager who's interfacing with someone telephonically or a virtual mm -hmm. visit, that they can conduct a screen and that counts uh, for measurement purposes. Wonderful. Um, so I'm going to see if we can go back to the q and I think we have a few more minutes. It definitely does race by, doesn't it, Michael? <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, just trying to see if we can utilize our last bit of time. So can you talk about to what extent community organizations and community experts are included at the beginning of planning and designing of screening and referral processes within health systems? So again, this is kind of referencing the screening and referral element, um, but I'm wondering if we can consider that, but also wonder, to what extent community-based organizations are included in quality measurement as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so states vary a lot in terms of how they do their work. Mm -hmm. um, the process that Oregon just had, they, they had seemingly hundreds of people. I know it wasn't that many, but a lot of people involved mm -hmm. from um, the community. Mm -hmm. um, but, but not all states work that way. Uh, in some states, it's a much more insular process. So it, it really depends on the, the culture of the state and how it doesn't work. Yeah, I think it's interesting to think about the complexity of even attempting to do a screen and intervene measure if you're not including the systems that will handle that referral, right? So there are definitely- Oh, oh yeah, for, especially <laughs> for that. Right, right. But, you know, that, again, that, that increases the burden for the state of trying to pull it off. Yeah, um, exactly. and a lot of state med ed Medicaid agencies are pretty darn constrained in terms of their resources. Um, and so sometimes they may do something that's not as inclusive, not because they don't want to, but they just don't have the bandwidth to do it. Yeah, you have to be able to make the investment. Now, you've done some work in Vermont, right? And what what process have they undergone in terms of involving community organizations? Well, so we have, um, Vermont has many unique approaches. As we, for instance, if we, we consider within our accountable care organization a statewide food and security measure a little bit ago as a first foray into trying to do a universal social risk screening. Um, one of the barriers actually that mim mimics kind of some of the early Oregon primary care association attempts at food and security measurement was data. So hence creating the, the gravity project. But um, uh, Vermont actually has embedded care coordination and care management in our um, food bank system. So the capacity to receive referrals and coordinated information like within that attempt at having a measure was more robust than many states. So again, it's very state specific. Um, so Vermont, again, in its, uh, its community-based organizations tends to have uh, care coordination and care management individuals that are able to speak to clinical systems in order to, in order to complete these kinds of things. That's great. Um, we're also utilizing uh, in Vermont um, the existing uh, kind of social risk screening from our long-term Medicaid Vermont chronic care initiative um, individuals and in trying to share that information through our health information exchange. But we can talk about that at a later podcast. <laughs> um, Jamie Carrillo has a question regarding the difference between screening for children versus adults. Um, so I guess maybe I'll try to take that. Uh, so. And one of the things that we do oftentimes in screening for uh, families, the adult can be the proxy for the family or the caregiver can be the proxy for the family. We see this again in the USDA food and security measure approaches, or again, as I was mentioning, the Bright Futures approaches. 
Um, but in many instances, there is a switch in early, early adolescent where, where we assume that there might be a difference in reporting between the individual and the caregiver. And so we split screening. So you can ask the, actually the individual directly. Uh, you also can parse out household member screening according to different adult members of the household, of course. Um, and there's, I'm gonna see if I can figure out some other questions here. Uh, the need to collaborate and share data across CBOs and healthcare providers is being done through many different SSRLs that create their own silos. Are there any state Medicaid efforts to create statewide publicly owned and ran SSRLs? I'm trying to understand what SSRL stands for. <laughs> I don't know either. <laughs> um, can someone help us understand what SSRL stands for? Or maybe we'll move along. Um, so uh, social service resource locators, there we go. Okay, so the need to collaborate and share data across CBOs and healthcare providers is being done through many different social service resource locators that create their own silos. Are there any state Medicaid efforts to create statewide publicly owned and ran SSRLs? I actually, Michael, do you have any thoughts on this one? In North Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, North Carolina is a really good example. Um, we also do know many instances of states collaborating with resource directory experts to create statewide resource directories. Uh, there's an expert of this on our call today. And then certainly um, there's many different initiatives of states collaborating with community refer referral platforms and two on one agencies to achieve the same. Um, let me just see, uh, oh, there's lots of conversations going on in here. So, um, let me just see. Oh, and then someone was referencing there was actually a program like Ambertha. So we, there's many different instances. So as you were referencing North Carolina, that's a Unite Us. Um, there's other there's other community referral platforms that do the same kind of partnering with. Yeah, and I I've heard lots of of you know discussion in states. Should the state own it? Should the health plan own it? Should the provider uh, be responsible? Um, it's it's messy and varied across states. Um, so we're kind of winding down and I wonder if Michael, if you have any other um, thoughts to add regarding this again, so we consider the topic of the day being accountability, right? So building accountability for social risk screening and state approaches. So any other final closing thoughts on that topic as we kind of make so, sure that we have our questions answered? <laughs> yeah, so the, you know, one of the ways that states use um, their purchasing tools for accountability is creating financial implications. Mm -hmm. and so. I just want to make clear that when states create measures, they're usually tying financial implications to performance against the measure. Mm -hmm. Maybe not the first year it's rolled out, but it becomes part of a quality incentive program or the formula for determining shared savings distribution to an ACO. Mm -hmm. But but that is a a a very purposeful accountability lever. Yeah. Um, and so um, an accountability, this is like one of the things I was thinking about before the call as well, is accountability across different stakeholders, right? So when you think about accountability, who's holding that, right? Is it the state? Is it the payer? Is it the provider? So any thoughts on that? We have about two minutes left in our call. It, it tends to ripple down. So, you know, it, it's state to plan or state to ACO. And then usually the plan or the ACO tries to build it into their uh, financial compensation model that they're using with their network of providers. Yeah, and then to get some alignment. Yeah, so for instance, uh, you know, we're just um, creating pathways in Vermont to allow primary care uh, clinics to be able to have more facile, um, like drawdown of value-based funds for just this reason, because accountable as a state can wait a year, accountable as an independent primary care office can't wait a year because you're running on a on a thin margin at any time. Right. Whew, I think um, so. There's some questions in the in the chat again. I want to apologize for not being able to answer all of the questions. Some of the questions were regarding screening approaches, and there really were some lovely conversations in previous coffee and science that I want to reference, just because it was it's difficult to answer all of them. Um, so this is I think we're we're one of the latter coffee and science, and the earlier ones have talked about screening and patients' perceptions of screening and dissemination of screening approaches. Um, so please go back and look at all of those other ones as well. Um, we're very, very grateful. Oh, sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> Michael, can you speak as my dog barks at the mailman? Well, I didn't know what you were about to say though. <laughs>
I'm so sorry. This is this is the, the hazard of doing Zoom from your home. Um, so, any other closing thoughts before we head off and uh, and and call and call the end of the script? Because I just end the session. I think Michael, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Good fun. Um, that's all we have time for today. I want to thank Michael for his insights and all of our listeners for joining us today. And again, I'm very, very sorry that we didn't get to all the questions. And thank you for tolerating my dog barking at the mailman. Um, the next Siren Coffee and Science session is scheduled on March 19th and will feature Mina Patal and Emily DeMarches, who will together explore the difference between social screening results and patients' interest around receiving assistance for social needs from their healthcare teams. This references a bunch of the questions we saw in the chat today. So I hope you all can attend at that time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Siren. Um, great colleague in this work, and we're very, very grateful for all of you for joining us today.